to introduce two people who I believe are, you know, on the forefront for the fight for liberty. I was so delighted when you said you would come and join us at Liberty Forum 2014. Um, we'll be talking about what country do we want to keep restoring freedom and liberty in the face of fear and tyranny. The format for this is it, it is an hour and a half session. Um, Thomas and Tom, Thomas or Tom. Thomas and uh, Jesslyn will be talking a little bit about their stories and sort of how they got here, um, and then we will have a Q&A session. So save your questions for the end, but um, it's a long session, so we really hope to open up the dialogue and uh, want to hear from you as well. Thomas uh, Drake is a hero. He is a man who stood up to the NSA and uh, whistle blew on issues that are very, very important. He used to be a senior executive with the National Security Agency, where he witnessed massive waste, contract fraud, and government wrongdoing, as well as widespread violations of the Fourth Amendment rights of US citizens. While at the NSA, he became a material witness and whistleblower for two 9-11 congressional investigations with the Department of Defense Inspector General audit Oh, sorry. I'm terrible at reading these things. I'm going to let Thomas talk a little bit about who he is. I also am delighted to say that Jessalyn Raddick is here. She's an attorney and she works with the Government Accountability Project. She just mentioned to me that we can mention that she will be representing uh, Edward Snowden going forward. <laughs> Um, and actually with that, I'm going to let you guys tell your story. So Jocelyn is coming up first, I believe, so um, you guys are in for a treat. Thank you. Now, I am mic'd up, so you should be able to hear me okay. But if you don't, let me know now before I talk. <coughs> and no one's hearing. Everyone okay? Yes. I, I have a feeling that as you talk, your voice is going to go down, so if you could amplify yourself, I think it'd be great. Yeah, louder would be better. Okay, I can do that. I can definitely do that. I am Jessalyn Radak. I uh, work for the Government Accountability Project, which is the nation's leading whistleblower organization. Um, and I have a very circuitous path to the job that I'm now in because I myself have been a whistleblower. Um, back during the George W. Bush administration, I was a Justice Department ethics advisor. Um, and I happened to be the attorney on call the day that um, I got a phone call from a criminal division attorney who said the FBI was on the ground in Afghanistan and had caught the first detainee in the war in Afghanistan, a fellow named John Walker Lind who was quickly dubbed the American Taliban. Um, and he told me matter-of-factly that Lind had counsel and wanted to know about the ethical propriety of interrogating him. <coughs> so I advised what I always would advise in this situation, that if someone has a lawyer, you can't interrogate them without their counsel. It's a pretty basic legal concept but uh, department attorneys somehow needed to be reminded of this. Um, so I gave that advice on a Friday, and I got a call back on Monday saying, ah, uh, oops, the FBI interrogated him anyway. No worries, this happens before what, yeah, when, the, when the criminal division or any other part of DOJ ignores ethics advice and does its own thing. Not to worry, just seal off the interrogation and use it for national security, use it for intelligence gathering, but not for criminal prosecution. So what did the Justice Department do? They used it to prosecute him criminally. So the Attorney General, who loved his flashy press conferences, went on TV to announce the indictment of the American Taliban, John Walker Lind. Meanwhile, pictures, trophy photos of him were circulating around the world. A picture, a famous picture of him bound, gagged, tied up, bound to a board with epithets written all over him. It looked very reminiscent of the photos we would later see um, in 2004 at Abu Ghraib. It was our first glimpse of torture 
but it was right after 9-11 and no one flinched. Anyway, um, the Attorney General had one of his big press conferences to announce that charges were being filed, criminal charges, against John Walker Lind. And a reporter said, you know, it looks like he's being tortured. You know, what's going on here? Um, and the Attorney General said that John Walker Lynn's rights had been carefully, scrupulously guarded, which was obviously false. Um, I am gagged from talking in depth about the torture part, um, but then, I mean, that was clear that was going on also, in addition to denying him counsel. A few weeks later, actually 10 days later, he had another press conference. This time, we're indicting John Walker Lind. And a reporter, again, said, I thought he had a lawyer. Has he had access to his lawyer? And Attorney General Ashcroft said, if we are aware that he has an attorney, he would definitely have access to that attorney. Again, another blatant lie. But like another whistleblower, Snowden, I was 29 years old and a bit naive and idealistic and thought, you know what, he's the Attorney General, it's his prerogative to say whatever he wants. Um, the criminal case continued to proceed, and then one day I got an email from the prosecutor saying, as you know, there is a federal court discovery order for all Justice Department correspondence related to John Walker Lynn's interrogation. I have two of your emails. I wanted to make sure I have everything. I knew I had written way more than two emails about this. Um, I, it was a file about an inch thick back in the days where we kept hard copy paper files on everything. Um, but luckily, I also had email at DOJ. And, you know, I, I, said, you know what, I know I wrote a ton of emails on this. I'm just, I'm just going to check the file. So I run up and check the hard copy file. And it's basically empty. There are two like very enough, like a fax cover sheet and a piece of paper saying thank you. Um, and some other thing saying we're closing out the file. So I was like, where did everything go? So I consulted with a very senior attorney who had been a US attorney for seven years. And I'm like, what's going on here? And he, he was familiar with the case. And he just said very matter of factly, this file has been purged. And that was inconceivable to me because the Justice Department was simultaneously prosecuting Arthur Anderson and Enron for obstruction of justice and destruction of evidence. So the idea that the DOJ would get rid of relevant evidence was completely counter to everything I believed. And I mean, and that's when I felt like, oh, I mean, something that was my aha moment or my moment of truth that something really wrong was going on. So I called technical support. And I said, is there any way to recover some of the emails I wrote? I wrote a lot of emails in this case. And luckily, the genius at technical support was able to walk me through a number of ballet steps to recover the emails that had been missing. That was something never contemplated, I guess, by whoever purged the file. I wrote a memo to my boss, and I documented more than a dozen emails, pretty incriminating ones that basically said the FBI screwed up and interrogated an American, John Walker Lind, without his counsel. I gave it to my boss and I said, you know, I'm not going to be a part of this. I don't know what's going on here, but I'm, I'm, I'm giving you my two weeks notice. I'm resigning because after 9-11, everything was changing at the department, and I didn't want to be wrapped up in what seemed to me like a huge cover-up. So I resigned. Um, I went to work for a private law firm doing unrelated stuff. 
and the criminal case continued to proceed. And John Walker Lind, like him, don't like him, it doesn't matter. I mean, the point is he's an American and he was denied counsel and the entire prosecution turned on the validity of the confession he gave during his interrogation without a lawyer. And there was a suppression hearing coming up to decide whether or not that confession would be admissible at trial. And over and over again, I kept hearing in the media, well, he never had a lawyer, so of course, the confession is admissible. At that point, he was facing a couple of life, you know, death penalty counts. And again, whether you think he's a terrorist or, or guilty or innocent or whatever, I couldn't live with the idea that someone might be put to death because my emails had obviously not made it to the court um, in compliance with the order. Um, I went to the judge. The judge told me I no longer had standing because I had left the Department of Justice, so I couldn't just directly give them to the judge. I tried. And when that didn't work, I mean, I had just, it was a raging insomniac and just many sleepless nights. And one morning I heard Micah Sakoff, who is with MSNBC now, he was on NPR saying, well, John Walker Lind never had an attorney, therefore everything he said is fair game in the trial. And there was sort of this national hysteria after 9-11, understandably to a certain degree. Um, <coughs> that was in, that permeated this whole thing. I mean, not only did we capture the first terrorist, but he was an American. I mean, really he was a lost 16-year-old who had got, you know, gone over and been caught in this bad situation, fighting somehow as a foot soldier with the Taliban, who up until four months earlier, US supported and gave money to. I guess he didn't get the memo that, you know, we had changed sides now after 9-11. So I called up Mike Isikoff and I'm like, look, I don't know who's giving you these talking points, but they're wrong. It's just plain wrong. He had an attorney, a pretty well-known attorney, very high profile attorney. Um, and Isikoff was like, do you have any proof? And I sent him the emails. Um, and he wrote an article called The Missing Lind Case Emails. Um, and after that, the case settled very promptly in a surprise plea bargain um, because the prosecution basically knew it couldn't go forward. It was going to lose in the suppression hearing. Um, and it had committed ethical misconduct. Um, so he pled guilty to two minor administrative counts, but he's serving like a very stiff 20-year sentence. But I thought, okay, thank God that whole episode is over with. But I didn't realize that in contacting a Newsweek reporter, in contacting Mike Isikoff, I had unleashed the full force of the entire executive branch. Agents came to my law firm and told them I was a criminal and that I would steal criminal files. Um, I, it took a while to figure out for them to actually admit that I was under investigation. I ended up retaining a lawyer. Um, he kept telling them over and over again that I blew the whistle on, on prosecutorial misconduct, not complying with a federal court order to turn over relevant documents in, a, in one of the most high profile cases going on at that time but the Justice Department did not care. They cared a lot more about going after me. They put me under one of the first federal criminal leak investigations in the US. Um, leaking, there's no such crime as leaking. There's just not, there's no crime called leaking. We do have something called the First Amendment that allows you to go to the media. But again, this is right after 9-11. And I didn't realize that our, our Constitution was now regarded as quaint and obsolete in the words of the next Attorney General, Alberto Gonzalez. Um, so they told the law firm I was under a criminal investigation. The law firm put me on an indefinite, unpaid leave of absence. Um, 
I applied for unemployment insurance and got my big, you know, like 100 bucks a week or whatever <laughs> to buy groceries and gasoline. The Justice Department helped my private law firm contest my receipt of unemployment benefits, which is weird, since when does the government help a third party like retaliate against an employee? But they did, but I won that one. The criminal case closed after a year and a half with no charges being um, brought, and again, I thought, good, this whole episode is behind me. I don't have to deal with this anymore. But no, the government was not through. Within weeks, they referred me to the state bars in which I'm licensed as an attorney. That really puts a, a damper on being able to get hired anywhere, because if you're under bar investigation, I don't know how many people here are maybe attorneys. Anyone? How many people here are NSA? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes people will raise their hands, and this is funny. <laughs> You're not supposed to do that. You're violating your secrecy agreement. Um, so I was under bar investigation. No one wants to hire you because just the fact that you're being investigated, even though you haven't been found to have committed a crime, is going to raise the malpractice liability insurance for wherever you want to work. Um, and then, in addition to that, I started having trouble flying with my family. I was pregnant with a four-year-old and a two-year-old. Well, that point a three-year-old and a one-year-old, um, and found out that I had been put on the select D portion of the no-fly list, which means you have to undergo secondary screening every time you want to fly, which may not seem like a big deal, but when your family gets through security and you're held up for half an hour and it's a matter of them getting on the flight without you, and, you know, it's, that happened. A number of times. Um, also, I mean, it was just obviously a lot of security theater, security theater that was meant to intimidate and harass. Obviously, I was not really a threat to aviation safety, which would have been a legitimate reason to put someone on the selectee portion of the no-fly list. So I was on that until about 2009. But as horrible as all that was, at least. I never got indicted. So when I did go back to work, I decided I was going to dedicate my life to representing whistleblowers because it was such a horrible ordeal. Um, and it actually didn't fully end until this past summer. The DC bar finally dismissed its complaint against me 10 years after it was filed, more than 10 years. Um, so I decided to go and represent with some lawyers and um, ended up with the Government Accountability Project. And I thought, OK, I'm going to be doing employment law, dealing with whistleblowers who have been demoted or had their security clearances pulled, or um, you know, maybe even, at worst, got fired. So my life was really jarred. I knew we had crossed a Rubicon when I read that a man named Thomas Drake had been indicted for leaking information that appeared to be in the public interest, and that he was indicted under something called the Espionage Act. And I said to me, this sounds like whistleblowing, classic whistleblowing. And no, like only three other people in history have been you know, indicted under the Espionage Act for non-spy activity. The first one, significantly, was Daniel Ellsberg, the Pentagon Papers whistleblower. And then there were two other cases in the next 40 years, and then Thomas Drake. I wrote, I immediately wrote an op-ed for the LA Times saying there's a difference between leaking and whistleblowing. Whistleblowing is to expose government fraud, waste, abuse, illegality, and dangers to public health and safety. Leaking 
has no public interest value. For example, when Rich Armitage and Scooter Libby bed that there was no yellow cake uranium in Niger. That had no public purpose, that leak. The, the biggest leaker, in fact, who's the biggest leaker in this country? <laughs> the government. The government, the US government is the biggest leaker in this country. Um, and with Tom's case, and I'll let Tom tell you about that, which we eventually won. I mean, there were 10 felony counts against him. When really, what was so stunning to me was that, you know, no one has a perfect, you know, clean history, but Tom Drake was the most vanilla guy. And he had gone through every conceivable channel. That's a compliment. <laughs> he was smiling. Well, there's actually a really funny uh, thing from the Daily Show that we'll try to find later when we speak with Trevor Tim or show some other time um, about a license to leak, about how, how spy-like Tom is. You can tell he's a bad guy. Um, but he had gone through what was so amazing. Like, whistleblowers often will go to one channel or the wrong channel where they'll try to get their message out and then they don't come to us until they're being retaliated against. But he had gone to his boss. He had gone to the NSA Inspector General. He had gone to the Department of Defense Inspector General. And he had gone to both the Intelligence Committees of Congress on both the House and Senate side. Talking about the wrongdoing that was occurring at NSA. And what was that? It was programs that were the embryonic stage of a lot of what Snowden is revealing now. So it just, I was hoping Tom's case was a weird one-off and that the fact that the case collapsed in such spectacular fashion because it turned out Tom had no classified information, the government had only seized information from his house and stamped it classified after the fact. That's why we have a provision in the Constitution about no ex post facto laws, because you don't want to get a ticket for driving 25 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone, and then when they suddenly change the speed limit to 15, and then ticket you for driving the proper speed limit the day before. It's simple, it's not fair. I was really hoping that Tom's case was a strange, weird experiment by the government. But unfortunately, it was the first in what are now up to eight, I believe, Espionage Act prosecutions of whistleblowers, of individuals for non-spy activity. Um, so we have John, I mean Tom Drake, and then I um, worked on John Kiriakou's case. He was a whistleblower. He was the first CIA agent to confirm that torture was part of a program and not a few <coughs> low-hanging bad fruit who were doing it. He confirmed that the U.S. was waterboarding people. He went public with that. And right now, he is serving two and a half years in jail away from his five kids and wife. If John Kiriakou had actually tortured someone, he would not be in jail today because he would be a beneficiary of the president's look forward, not backwards policy for all CIA agents who had actually engaged in the detention, rendition, and interrogation program. I ended up also uh, representing other whistleblowers from the NSA with whom Tom had blown the whistle, William Binney and Kirk Weeby and Ed Loomis. Um, and then these indictments kept piling up. And then Bradley Manning's case happened, and I think the administration completely became unhinged. <laughs> Obama is obviously driven to distraction by leaks. Um, and just when, just when I'm sure they were really just cracking down, Edward Snowden happened. And Edward Snowden's case, Edward Snowden in the two videos by Laura Poitras said, 
I saw what happened to Tom Drake. So every time you read articles like Diane Feinstein's yesterday, or Mike Rogers the week before, or General Hayden's lecture two weeks ago, every time you hear, he could have gone through proper channels. No, he couldn't have, because guess what? He would have ended up being charged with espionage anyway. Not only did going through proper channels not get Tom Drake any kind of meaningful redress, it got him turned into the culprit when he had done nothing wrong but try to expose NSA Ill illegalities. So Snowden <laughs> did the only thing he could really on a disclosure this amazingly large. And he blew the whistle. I'm sure a lot of people have questions about that. And we can talk later because there's a lot of disinformation and propaganda regularly coming out of the government about him being a spy, about him, why did he go flee to Russia, and about endangering America. Um, but again, the, what those things were said about Tom Drake. By virtue of charging someone under the Espionage Act, you are labeling them an enemy of the state. In fact, the prosecutor in Tom Drake's case said that he would have the blood of soldiers on his hands when NSA goes dark. It's the same fear mongering you're hearing today about Edward Snowden. The one person who I think might allow us to rein in our democracy from becoming a complete surveillance state. Um, I hope that we can do that. In the meanwhile, it's very um, difficult and isolating. Um, I thought that with John going to jail, that was the worst thing that could happen until I realized Edward Snowden was rendered stateless and had to get political asylum. That's the price you have to pay for trying to tell the truth and trying to go through proper channels. And that's not to discourage people from whistleblowing. I want people to whistleblow them but I want you to do it safely. So if you want to blow the whistle, consult a lawyer first, and we can help you do that in a safe way. Um, usually, I would say 95% of the people come to us after they've blown the whistle and the government's retaliating against them. So um, I would urge anyone um, who who's thinking of doing that to consult a lawyer. And I will turn you over to the amazing Tom Drake, who's been a wonderful friend, client, and um, kindred spirit on this crazy journey that we're on right now, talking to whoever wants to hear from us in the hopes of salvaging our democracy. So thank you for hearing us today. It's an extraordinary honor, to, extraordinary honor to be here today. I want to start off with a couple of light moments, given that we are in New Hampshire. Tom, you're a little bit hard to hear. He's working on it.
no. Yeah. <laughs> Audio. <laughs> I want to start off with a couple light moments, uh, given that we're in the great state of New Hampshire. There is a state west of you called Vermont. I'll refer to Vermont and New Hampshire as sibling uh, rivals. If you can't tell them apart, according to most people, except one of them is upside down. <laughs> As we know, the motto of New Hampshire is live free or die, in Vermont it's live free and die. <laughs> you have a flag that says don't tread on me. Well, you know, Vermont does have its own dagger of dissent, uh, exemplified by the Green Mountain Boys and Ethan Allen. Um, the rock, I believe, in New Hampshire, uh, the state rock, is granite. Although the old man in the mountain did, his face did fall off. <laughs> not sure how hard that was. We have marble in Vermont, and it's soft. Uh, Vermont's landlocked, and New Hampshire has beaches. Uh, Vermont does have the oldest constitution in the states. New Hampshire is second, adopting uh, its constitution in 1704, seven years after Vermont's. Uh, Vermont does yield the sweet ambrosia of maple syrup. Uh, New Hampshire yields us the Old Farmer's Almanac and Pewter. <laughs> Speaking of maple syrup, do you see the latest revelations that we knew this when I was a kid growing up on a farm in Vermont? That apparently uh, maple syrup, there's a re recent sap discovery of regarding maple, that it's, we've had it wrong all along. Sap does rise, at least within the trees in Vermont, but apparently when you're upside down, it makes it a lot easier to tap them. <laughs> so right side up, left side down, twin states separated by the Connecticut River. New Hampshire and Vermont are simply America's quotation marks. <laughs> my confession is I did grow up in Vermont. I consider Vermont my home state, I did start, I grew up in the First Republic, as it's known, after moving from an even older former republic called the great state of Texas. While I lived in Vermont, I went to a one-room schoolhouse. I was the only kid in third grade. Half the school was one family. But there's one thing about Vermont that was extraordinary, just to set the scene, it was a Vermont town meeting day. It was the one time during the year when anybody in town could say their piece. Anybody. You didn't have to disagree with them. You could agree with them. But you were there to listen. The voice of the community was heard at town meeting day. And I remember in Wells, Vermont, where I spent most of my youth in Vermont, I still remember Fred Cooper was the voice of the community. He was the conscience of the community. Fred spent most of his time driving around the highways and byways and the dirt roads of Wells. No one ever quite figured out how he managed to run a dairy farm or even keep his cows in order, because <laughs> half the time they're out in other people's fields. But any time Fred spoke at the Vermont town meeting in March during mud season, people listened because he would tell you what wasn't right. He would grudgingly acknowledge the things that were right. And if you didn't listen to Fred, you could just say he was really the community's local crier slash whistleblower. You did so at your own peril. I'm reminded of that because it's extraordinarily poignant for me to stand here before you as a free man. Do you know what it means? Do you know what it means to keep your freedom? When the government did everything they could to take that of freedom away from me, do you know what it means to actually keep those freedoms? They mean more to me now than ever. Because I was able to keep my freedoms. I did not end up in jail. I did not hang in fine. I remained free after an extraordinary five-year-old ordeal. We must restore our constitutional republic one person at a time, one community at a time, and one state at a time. 
See, the times we live in right now are eerily, eerily similar to the pre-revolutionary period in our history. Before we actually separate ourselves from the crown, New Hampshire, acknowledging New Hampshire, was the first to declare its independence. And yet in today's world, in the 21st century America, it is a dangerous act of criminality to speak truth to or of power. The Obama administration is being engaged now in an unprecedented war on whistleblowers and truth tellers. More Americans have been charged under the World War I era statute called the Espionage Act than all other administrations combined. It is a direct assault on the First Amendment, the cornerstone amendment of the Bill of Rights. You take out the cornerstone, the house collapses. And yet the government regards information as a coin of the realm and wants to control it, wants to control the message, wants to hold it. Information is power. It's important for you to understand that the two of us up here before you we are the canaries in the constitutional coal mine. We do not want the rest of this country, let alone the citizens of New Hampshire, to live what we've lived at the hands of the national security and surveillance state. It is not, I repeat, not a pretty picture. We are the ones who have watched and continue to watch the watchers, but we didn't just watch. We stood on the top of the equivalent of Mount Washington of the national security state and blew the whistle. Imagine standing on the top of Mount Washington. And if you say something, is anybody there to hear it? As I recall, the highest recorded wind speed on this globe was actually, was actually measured on the top of Mount Washington some decades ago. Triple the speed of the average hurricane. At the time, no one else really heard us, truth be told, except the government, and they were listening. <laughs> 9 11 was my first day on the job. It's a day that I will always remember. I was hired in under a special program by General Hayden. And yet, when 9 11, the tragedy, the murders, the 3,000, both New York and the Pentagon, the government had utterly failed its fundamental responsibilities under the Constitution. We often forget this, even Americans, had utterly failed. Go back to the preamble, two fundamental responsibilities of government, provide for the general defense and the common welfare, utterly failed on the first. Systemic failure, and NSA was fundamentally culpable did not keep people out of harm's way. And look what it unleashed. What I was eyewitness to in those literally days and weeks after 9-11 was the government unchaining itself from the Constitution. An anathema form of government. Not only had the wheels come off, I recognized to my core that we were in an entirely different vehicle, and I did not recognize that vehicle, and I vowed then, and I continued to vow in the intervening years until I could no longer remain within the system, because I had taken an oath, an oath to what? An idea, an idea, and how to govern ourselves. Supporting, defending the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And to my horror, I realized that the enemy was now my own government. The government had abandoned what I had spent a lifetime defending. Subverting the very Constitution that I had taken an oath four times in my career, once in the military, in the Air Force, say twice in the military, Air Force during the Cold War, flying an RC 135s, which I became an expert in East Germany and the Warsaw Pact as a German Russian linguist. CIA, where I was an imagery analyst, at the Navy, serving in the Pentagon, 
and the Alert Center, National Military Joint Intelligence Center, I was eyewitness to the subversion of our own Constitution. And I will tell you now, and I will keep saying it, and I've said it over the last several years, it was never necessary. It never had to happen. Never. I am burdened by dark history and dark knowledge of what could have been. I knew that if I remained silent, that I would be complicit in a crime. I knew that if I remained silent, I would be an accessory to a crime. We're talking about crimes as defined in the Constitution, high crimes and misdemeanors. Three categories, I'll just summarize them. Secret surveillance on a scale that has still not been fully revealed to this day. Go back and listen to my March 15, 2013 Sunshine Wheat speech at the National Press Club. An extraordinary surveillance apparatus completely violating the Fourth Amendment, totally violating the exclusive means by which NSA can conduct electronic surveillance on U.S. persons, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, turning the United States into the equivalent of a foreign nation for blanket dragnet electronic surveillance. As I've said before, and I'll say it again, the government regarded all of us as foreigners. Massive fraud, waste, and abuse. I cannot begin to tell you the, the sheer amount of money, the billions and billions and billions of dollars they were pumped into. It's now hundreds and hundreds of billions. It's actually in the low trillions now, the amount of money since 9-11 that's been spent on quote unquote security. And the thing that haunts me to this day is I blew the whistle on the intelligence failures that lie at the heart of 9-11. The NSA had critical information that was never shared. And if it had been shared, there is no doubt in my mind that it would have stopped 9-11 all by itself. In 2006, after exhausting every channel that existed, as described by Jesslyn, I ended up going to the press, exercising my First Amendment rights. And what I knew, anybody ever been visited by the FBI? Yes. yes. <laughs> it's not a pleasant experience. I was getting ready for work on November 20, 2007, where I was then teaching after going through extraordinary retaliation reprisal at the hands of the government within the system, essentially being left bereft with no job and no we made up title. <clears throat> I was teaching as a professor of behavioral science, leadership, strategic leadership, information strategies, and leadership ethics. They showed up at my house with a warrant. They showed up at my office at the university. And they also had a warrant for my car. There was yet another warrant, it turns out, or my internet service provider. That's when the nightmare began. A dozen FBI agents armed streaming across the front yard. They tossed my house. They took my personal effects. They managed to convince a magistrate judge that I was a national security threat. In fact, apparently I was such a national security set, set a threat because I was causing and had caused exceptionally grave damage to the United States of America. Their central thesis was focused on what I knew about the secret surveillance programs. So where are the sons and daughters of liberty today? Where are, who are, the sons and daughters of liberty today?
Because see, that FBI raid began, although I've been under extraordinary surveillance both electronic and physical in the intervening 18 months, it only just begun the nightmare. Because two and a half years later, to make a long story short, there's a lot that went on in between. Under the Obama administration, I was charged on the Espionage Act, the first whistleblower since Dan Ellsberg. The first under Obama charged with espionage. <coughs> A government bound to protect liberty is now unbounded with the self authorizing license to subvert our liberty in the name of national security. National security has become the state religion. The Constitution is a threat. It's in the way of national security. You must think about this, and I'm going to use really strong language. Because in the intervening years, and with a remarkable woman to the right of me, I was able to keep my freedoms. She was my voice when I had none. She was my defender in the court of public opinion. They had confiscated my passport. I could not travel outside the United States. Any travel outside the local area required special permission of the court. The government had right of first refusal. The only thing he did not do was put a bracelet on me. My life was completely turned upside down. Their design on me was to destroy me. Remember why they came after me. If I'm the government and I have the secret ability to collect and analyze data with few, if any, constraints, all this stuff we've seen since the Patriot Act, Vice Amendments Act, any number of other Enabling Act legislation, Enabling Act, go back and look at Article 48 during a certain period in German history. Redefining law to give the appearance, the kabuki dance appearance of legality. Conveniently forgetting about the Constitution as the law of the land. I grew up in the 1970s as a very young adult. I remember the Pentagon Papers and Watergate and a president resigning his office. I remember the articles of impeachment abusing instruments of national power against their own citizens History doesn't forget, and history's not kind. But if you have the secret ability to collect and analyze data, especially on people, I will tell you it is seductively powerful. And when done without your permission, when done without your knowledge, when done in secret, it is the ultimate form of control over others. Because that's what all this is about. Very, very little that has anything to do with the existential threat of terrorism. And when you have this magnitude of surveillance hiding behind the veil of secrecy, while it professes openness and transparency, remember the Obama administration trademark alert will be, become the most open and transparent administration in US history. <laughs> <laughs> While practicing opaqueness and deceit, that's when citizens need to become extremely aware and wary of what that future might hold because their very liberties are being eroded out from under them, taken away in the name of national security without our consent. And all this fear mongering, invocation of threats, real and imagined, what kind of climate does that create? Because the government wants to control both the public and the private agenda. Because my criminal case is direct evidence of an out of control system. It is literally an off the books government. I keep saying this, people don't want to believe it. I said earlier in my talk 
The government unchained itself from the Constitution. It's been operating under emergency conditions ever since. That's the truth. I knew that right after 9-11. Remember the oath I took. It's only an oath to an idea and how to govern ourselves. It was a grand experiment launched over 220 years ago. But a woman reporter purportedly asked Benjamin Franklin at the conclusion of that Constitutional Convention, that long, hot summer in Philadelphia in 1787, what did you guys create in there? And he reportedly said, a republic if you can keep it. There were no guarantees. None. This rise in a contrarian, alien form of government cannot, I repeat, cannot coexist with constitutional government. Something has to give. And this shape of a national security state evidence the all too familiar and historically, the historical characteristics are all too familiar, all too distinct form of an alarming soft tyranny. It is anathema to all forms of constitutional republics and democracies. Anybody read Montesquieu? No tyranny is more cruel than that which is practiced in the shadow of the law and with the trappings of justice. That is, one would drown the unfortunate by the very plank by which he would hope to be saved. What happens when you sacrifice the rights of the citizenry and our own individual sovereignty for mass surveillance, primacy of power, privilege, access, information control, the brutal crackdown by the Obama administration on whistleblowers and truth tellers is extraordinary. We've never seen in recorded history this kind of surveillance state. And I recognize that NSA did not originate the surveillance state because I used to fly against one, several. But they're doing this and have been doing this, NSA, until my own disclosures and others, but in particular since the Snowden disclosures. I've been doing this on an extraordinarily vast scale in secret. The heart of the democratic and constitutional paradigm is turned inside out and upside down. Secret dossier is held by the state. We've never had, because of technology, the ability to persistently collect what I will call the panopticon of power constant gaze, always having even more access to even more information about people, just in case. Look, the Stasi, the state in, of East Germany, we're not East Germany yet, but we certainly have all the trappings of that surveillance apparatus. They were monstrously efficient in keeping files in just about everybody. Their indexing scheme, some recent reporting, which I was very familiar with back then, they had what they called metadata. It wasn't called, they didn't use that term, although I prefer to use meta content, but that was the metadata that allows them access to what else is available in terms of content on people. What does that say about who we are? What happens when someone like myself is criminalized for exercising my First Amendment rights <laughs> because I'm exposing government wrongdoing and illegality? I remind you of what U.S. Senator Frank Church said during the 1970s, extraordinary set of hearings, although I'd argue the Pike Committee hearings were even more extraordinary, but even in terms of Frank Church's hearings, he said, quote, if a dictator ever took charge in this country, the technological capacity that the intelligence community has given the government could enable it to impose total tyranny and there'd be no way to fight back because the most careful effort to combine together resistance to the government no matter how privately it was done, is within reach of the government to know. Such is the capacity of technology. You know, Benjamin Franklin had a very interesting quote. He was always known for his aphorisms. You know what he said about democracy? 
two wolves and a lamb, but what do you want to have for a meal? And liberty is a well-armed lamb contesting the vote. Liberty is a well-armed lamb contesting the vote. So the Constitution, if you haven't heard, expired on 9-11. We are reaping the whirlwind of everything since. But I hear something, and I just want to share this before we transition to the Q&A period. I keep hearing this. Tom, I have nothing to hide. I have nothing to hide. Do you realize in saying that statement, you've already given up your privacy? You don't care about your privacy? You don't want to defend your privacy? the very essence of who you are as a human being, a sovereign human being under natural law. You know who actually said you have nothing to worry about if you have nothing to hide? The chief propagandist during the Nazi era. Joseph Goebbels. So, I just want to conduct a mini privacy exercise with you all. So indulge me for a minute, because every time I run this exercise, no one has said yes yet, it's except one cute person who said maybe in California. <laughs> so if you say you have nothing to hide, because I keep hearing this, continue to hear this, then why don't you just give me the keys to your car right now? I don't have one. <laughs> why don't you give me the keys to your apartment or your house? all the passwords of every account you have, just hand over all your medical records. Just give them to me. You say you have nothing to hide. All your computers, everything there is to know about you, just give it to me. Would you? No. Why? Because it's my your business. It's your information, but you have nothing to hide. If you have nothing to hide, you should be more than willing, by consent, to give me your information. Don't you trust me as a fellow American citizen? I'm one of you. I'm not one of them. I'm not some foreign agent. Why not? Because it's mine. It's mine. Really? You own something? Really? You know, it's funny because if you're not willing, if people are not willing to give up what is theirs by consent, why do so without your consent? Fear. Fear. Wow, fear. You know, I, not take, I did not take an oath to defend fear. I didn't. You know, unfortunately, I didn't end up in an actual prison. I expressed who I am and was defended based on who I am as a sovereign individual with inalienable rights, amongst which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those extraordinary words in the Declaration of Independence and a form of government after the abysmal failure of the Articles of Confederation that launched the United States of America. The last thing we need is some kind of fence around us. What Adams and the Sons of Liberty did in Boston was spread the word about the abuses of the British. They had committees of correspondence. Look up the history. It's really extraordinary. It's so eerily familiar to me. It's like we're going back to the future that already happened. We need committees of correspondence now. That's taking action. Because what's happening is this whole landscape of who we are and sovereignty is being transformed. Did you, I said the US government unchained itself from the Constitution. Guess what replaced it? Article two powers that are apparently inherent in that role called commander in chief of the president. Do you know what that does to the rest of the landscape? It militarizes it. I used to be in the military. I'm very familiar with that system. But what happens when you militarize everything? Under the so-called Article II justification, which, by the way, is a complete subversion of what that actual role is. 
It has become now a political crime. Think about history to expose government crimes against society. Knowing all this, exposing wrongdoing illegality is not sufficient. See, I could argue as a student of politics and history that if you do away with just, never mind the second, the third, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth, the tenth, the fourteenth, and a couple of others, but in particular, based on the pre-revolutionary period, if you do away or substantially erode the First and Fourth Amendment, I will argue you do not have an America. You do not. And that's what's disappearing. Do we really want the government listening in and tracking the lives of so many others? Is intolerance shown by the secret, secret federal government for the magnificence of our precious First Amendment, freedoms a foreboding of things to come? Will national security replace individual rights, where citizens with rights simply become subjects with privileges dispensed by the state? I will resist with every fiber of my being. Will fear take priority over freedom? Will government censorship and propaganda triumph over personal choice and disclosure? Is suppression and repression, as we've experienced in any number of others and some you have never even heard about, become the instrument for stamping out dissent? And those who dare question what this cube represents especially authority. Is the tree of liberty, is the tree of liberty becoming an endangered species? Better start planting some trees. Remember Johnny Appleseed. Who defends our rights in the face of secret government power? You know, none of this is necessary. I still wake up with chills at night because I knew that the very best of American ingenuity and innovation had solved this problem. We never had to go to the dark side. It was never necessary. Could have prosecuted, got after the bad guys. Done so completely within bounds. It was all rejected. So change is needed, but it cannot be faux change. It cannot be fake change. It cannot be just changing the ruffles on the surveillance drapes to merely a different color. If you look it up, we, myself and other colleagues, we sent a memo, an open memo to the president. We also listed 22 recommendations on what to do. It was necessary to roll back the national security state. And so I'll end with this. I fully appreciate and acknowledge that Americans give the government wide berth. Bismarck was right. It's like government, governance, like making sausage. Most people don't like to watch sausage being made. More majority of Americans accept the need to safeguard who we are, bring to light legitimate crimes against Americans and others. But there's this pernicious ends justifies the means. That somehow it's a zero sum game, the false dichotomy, that to have security we have to erode liberty. When in fact, the foundations of our security rest directly on our liberties and our freedoms and our rights as sovereign human beings. Our credibility as a nation has been severely undermined, not only in the United States, but overseas. I had this extraordinarily chilling conversation with a couple from Germany recently. He said, Tom, at least we know we live in a post-fascist society. You all live in a pre-fascist society and don't even know it. 
fascism, oh my gosh, you use the word fascism, and people really cringe. So what do we do? I've given you some hints. We have to restore the Constitutional Republic, period. That's the first thing. We need to ensure that if we starve liberty for the sake of security, if we forsake liberty for the sake of security, what will we have left to defend? It is our freedom of choice that's at stake as citizens. It is not the government's to take them away. We must now rescue the Constitution from our own government. Our rights and our precious liberties are the very living blueprint and beacon for our personal freedoms. And so I do hear a new cry for liberty across the land. It is time for a new revolution. A revolution that restores the sovereignty of the people. This conference itself provides the very tools, the very connections, the very community you need to restore what is rightfully our inheritance as sovereign citizens. We must, must, I repeat, must elect into office a whole new generation of leaders locally, regionally, and nationally. We must continue to expose and disclose the usurpations of power against the people, establishing community-wide action committees, safeguarding not just personal, but also our community-based economic freedom. Remember, those who are best governed are least governed, but that's the weak spot in the Constitutional Republic. I don't want to see the grand experiment. I really don't disappear in the dustbins of history. The question we must answer for ourselves and our posterity is fundamental. What future do we want to keep? After all, after all, we are the people. We are the people. Those extraordinary words, the preamble of the Constitution, that we are the people in order to form a more perfect union standing here together, defending and protecting the very best of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness on the front lines of freedom, as citizens with inalienable rights and not subjects of the state. Thank you. for me. Can you hear me? No. No. That was emotional, wasn't it? Yeah. Wasn't it amazing? Yes. Thank you so much for what you did. Um, Paul, I don't know what I'm doing. Oh. All right. Here you go, Daryl. I actually have a question for each one of you individually. Uh, Mr. Drake, Knowing that there are more laws on the books than could be read in, I've heard, four lifetimes, would you agree that the only crime is disobeying the state? Yeah, that's, certainly, that's certainly what it's come to. Yeah, you disobey the state, but they're the ones defining uh, how you disobey or whether or not you disobey. I mean, one of the things, there's an arbitrariness here beyond what is established as the supreme law of the land with due process and all of, all of the procedures that protect 
your innocence until proven beyond all doubt that you're guilty, and that's done in a court of law. That's an Article Three court, not any other court. If you don't have that, then it's fiat law. And that's not real law. That's, ex that's executive rule. And Ms. Raddick, uh, could you go into as much detail as you were allowed uh, about the incident that you had in Heathrow Airport a few days ago where you were questioned in detail about your connection to Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, and Private Manning? Yeah, um, I was going to um, London to um, present the Sam Adams Award for Integrity and Intelligence um, to a representative of Bradley Manning. And in going through customs, which of course is militarized and called the border force in England, um, they asked the usual questions like, why are you here? I said, to see friends. They're like, who? I said, the Sam Adams Associates. Who, 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 are, who are those people? I named some public figures that, you know, that are in the group, like Tom and, my, and you know, Ray McGovern, Colleen Rowley, Annie Michonne. Um, but then they asked why I had gone to Russia twice in the last three months. And I just said that I have a client there and they said, who? And I said, Edward Snowden. <laughs> okay, it gets better. <laughs> and then they said, who is Edward Snowden? <laughs> Obviously, I couldn't give a flip answer, like, have you been asleep for the last eight months? <laughs> Not read a newspaper? He's like one of the most well-known people on the planet right now. Um, but I couldn't do that. I knew. In my mind, I had to calculate what kind of answer can I give that would be satisfactory because this question is completely out of line. I could have just said, a human being, a person. I, so I just said, a, a whistleblower and an asylee because that was a legal definition that fit. Um, and then he wanted to know, who is Bradley Manning? I said, he's a whistleblower. And then he said, where is Bradley Manning? As if he didn't know. I said, in jail. And he said, well, then he's a criminal. And I said, he's a political prisoner. And then he said, but you represent Snowden. And I said, I am a human rights attorney. And it ended there, but it was very intimidating. I was definitely very rattled by it because these matters of clients, who I represent, and what meetings I've gone to with different clients, um, that delves into the attorney-client privilege. Tom has authorized me to be public that I represent him. It is public that I am a legal advisor, one of Snowden's legal advisors. Um, you know, but being put in that kind of position of who you represent, who are, you know, and being asked about clients is beyond the pale. And it was done for no other reason than to intimidate and rattle me and unnerve me, which it did. Um, but I guess they didn't realize I'd already been on the no-fly list, so they put me on some inhibited person list. Um, I'm one of the least inhibited people. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, at least on the East Coast. Um, but I didn't realize that flying was now a hazard, you know, a, a job hazard, but it is. I could be mistaken on this, but it seems to me that part of the reason that the government does have so much control over us and can do all the evil things it's been doing is because it can take money from us. Do you have any advice as to what we can do <laughs> to uh, hold on to our own money and it will at least stop some of the things that, that you even admitted um, they spend a lot of money on and they're getting it from us? I think the most effective thing, one of the most effective things you can do, first of all, I mean, I, I can't advise anyone to be a pro se tax protester. Or, <laughs> I can't 
you know, do that. But like for example, when I got my bill for bar juice while I was still under investigation for the ninth and tenth year, I would pay it and write in protest, you know, when I paid it. My signature line on my email, and I urge all of you under your signatures just to make it an automatic, this email is being monitored without consent in secret by the National Security Agency. This email is being collected and stored by the National Security Agency without my consent or that of the other party. Because it makes people actually think. It makes people actually realize that this is tangible. No matter how innocuous your email is, it's being kept and stored. So your email with a little inside joke or something, or your, you know, if you look at my Google search, I, you know, it's like Al Qaeda, Arabian Peninsula, crockpot bombs, <laughs> fertilizer bombs. Um, why do men have nipples? I look like a perverted terrorist. <laughs> but really, in context. I'm a mom of two teenage boys, and I am a lawyer doing my job, and terrorism and national security happens to be a focus of that torture in particular. Um, I think it is incredibly important. It does matter. I live in DC. I don't have a voting representative in Congress, but you guys do. And every single time you actually call or email, they make a mark. So, and I know it's not perfect, but call them. There is easy to do through the internet and say, I support the USA Freedom Act. I don't support Dianne Feinstein's bullshit law. <laughs> the other thing to do, which was when Justin Amash had a bill to defund the entire NSA, any spying programs that spied on Americans, that almost passed. It failed by 12 votes, and I bet if people in America had been more vocal that this must pass, it would have passed even people who voted against it, like Sensenbrenner, who wrote the Patriot Act, for God's sake. Even he said that if he knew all the information that has been revealed now because of Snowden, he would have voted for that. I think the only way to really choke the national security state is to defund it. It is more than one sixth of the US budget is being spent on fake secrecy, body scanners at airports, taking off your shoe, all this security theater that has become a part of our daily life and really does nothing. Did it prevent the Boston bombing? No. Is having surveillance camera good for accident reconstruction? Sure. But even the government's, how many cameras in Boston? I, I mean, hundreds of cameras in Boston were not enough. They had to do a crowdsourced manhunt to try to find the Sarniev brothers. And it turned into an interesting experiment in militarized police where people just went in, you know, police and law enforcement went into people's houses without warrants to look. Um, 